Hi, welcome to my podcast, Reclaim. I am your host, Thais Skye. I have supported women navigate the complexities of being human for over 10 years. This podcast is where I disseminate some of those learnings and offer thoughts and guests to guide you into your healing. Welcome. Hello, beautiful humans. It is Thais Sky. I'm so happy to be here with you all. And I got a really wonderful uh, interview to share with you in just a moment. Uh, but first, I wanted to check in. How are you doing? Welcome to part two of season four of Reclaim. I shared uh, episodes last week all about loneliness and self-trust. If you haven't listened to it, I'm kind of, I'm kind of a fan, kind of into that podcast. I think it's a way of talking about things and understanding ourselves that isn't really often talked about in the world of Instagram and catchy slogans. And so I hope you get to enjoy it. And that's why I do this podcast. You know, the podcast really should be called The Thais Show. Let's be honest here. It's an opportunity for me to share <laughs> lots of my own thoughts. But I also have some guests that I really enjoy to share their thoughts too. But I share this podcast, I create this podcast because I want there to be a platform, a space in the world where I can add a little bit more nuance to some of the things that I write online. I love writing online and writing online has its limitations. It misses um, the language of it, uh, the, the dialogue of it, the context of it. And the podcast is a way that I can add some context and nuance. And you get to learn a little bit about me and my background. And that can help you make sense of why I say what I say and how, why I write what I write. So I hope that, you know, this podcast can continue to serve you in the future as a space for you and I to be in it together. I really want this to be a podcast where you get to feel like you're you're partnered. And, and I know it's weird to be partnered with a voice <laughs> on a phone, but to know that you're not alone and that I'm here figuring things out with you and um, you don't have to figure it all out by yourself. And I'm imagining if you're listening to this episode or listening to this podcast, it's because you kind of already get the sense that you don't want to do it alone or you don't have to do it alone. And hopefully this just is a reminder for you. You certainly don't have to do it alone. So let me uh, read Iris's bio. I'm really excited to have Iris on the podcast. I really enjoy her Instagram presence. Um, and Iris is a certified trauma coach and NARM practitioner specializing in self-sabotage, eating disorder recovery, and complex trauma. After struggling with bulimia, uh, complex PTSD, and depression for over a decade, Iris became determined to understand what was fueling her self-destructive behaviors and troubling symptoms. This eventually led her to an in-depth study of trauma, which resulted in a radical personal transformation. She now helps people all over the world overcome similar struggles through trauma-informed education, group programs, and individual coaching. You can learn more about her on the show notes. You can go to her website, um, and you can learn more about NARM. Um, I actually, because it's such a prevalent part of her bio, um, NARM is... Um, let me read it. It's the Neuro Effective Relational Model. It's um, a clinical training program for mental health practitioners who work with complex trauma. NARM is a cutting edge model for addressing attachment, relational, and developmental trauma by working with the attachment patterns that cause lifelong psychobiological uh, symptoms and interpersonal difficulties. And so, you know, NARM is um, one of the many, many, many kind of newer um, certification models that are now coming out to give us uh, more additional tools um, uh, in in the in the world of healing our trauma and um, what I love about something like NARM is that most of these kind of newer more cutting edge you know exciting new certifications all stem from psychodynamic psychotherapy psychodynamic psychotherapy has been around for a long time it is Oh, it's such a, a, a wonderful way of understanding the human experience and psychodynamic psychotherapy is really focused on how to create a healing container for our clients. It is what I am trained in. It is how I work with people. And if you haven't listened to uh, my series, Talk Therapy, How to Get the Help You Need, I b basically break down in one of the parts 
all the different types of psychotherapies and how each of them kind of relates to change. Um, and I talk all about psychodynamic psychotherapy there. Anyway, I just want to kind of contextualize with Norma so you can really understand Iris's kind of background and so you can understand this conversation that we have on an even deeper level. So this conversation is all about developmental trauma. And we talk a little bit about how you can how you can know if you have developmental trauma, what it can look like. And um, we kind of explore um, what is this healing and how may it show up in our lives? Um, I do a lot of work in developmental trauma. This is one of my specialties. And so having this conversation with Iris was really, really wonderful um, and an opportunity for me to talk about something that I'm very passionate in. So as you're listening to this episode, you know, you know, take a a moment to kind of come to um, come inward and and notice how it feels to listen to this conversation and and notice where what may resonate for you. And of course, like all things, um, trust what lands and let go of what doesn't. And uh, thanks for listening. Let's bring on Iris now. Hello, everybody. Tay Sky here, and I have Iris with me today. Hi, Iris. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you too. It's such an honor. I mean, I, I shared with you before we click record, but I typically find a lot of my guests through Instagram because obviously that's where I'm at and that's where a lot of people find me. And I don't know how I stumbled onto your Instagram, but gosh, I'm so glad that I did because I just really appreciate your perspective, your way of thinking about things, your way of operating in the world. Um, and I would love for you to share just a little bit, you know, what people what you want people to know about you and how you got into this line of work um, that may not have been in your bio. Yeah. Ooh, there's a lot I could say about how I got into this line of work, (laughs) but I mean, I think, you know, the brass tacks version is that, you know, I became really, really passionate about trauma through my own healing process. You know, I struggled with a lot of things from depression to, eating disorders and didn't realize until quite a bit later in my recovery process that trauma was fueling a lot of the symptoms that I was experiencing. And so the more I learned about that, the more fascinated I became. And for the last, gosh, I don't know how many years now I've been on this sort of rabbit hole journey, trying to learn as much as I possibly can. And I love sharing what I'm learning and things that were helpful to me on Instagram, because there was just so much that nobody told me things I kind of had to dig around pretty deeply to find in some pretty obscure books. And so I'm really passionate about making trauma education more widely available for people. Yeah, and I think, of course, the conversation of trauma has become more popular um, in the past few years, which I think is of can be of great benefit. And and then we start to get into like the different types of trauma, and we start to get into like what is the difference between this trauma, that trauma, what is trauma, what isn't trauma. And I I know one specialty of yours that I have um, personally um, spent a lot of time thinking about, researching, and understanding is developmental trauma. And so I thought maybe we could start there of like how do you how do you even define, you know, developmental trauma? What is developmental trauma? Yeah. Yeah. So the really simple answer is that developmental trauma is trauma that interferes with our natural development. So when we're, when we're growing, I mean, we're always developing and growing, but especially, you know, between the ages of, you know, well, even from when we're in utero till the time we're about six years old, there's so much happening for us developmentally. And so when we experience trauma at this really tender stage that can interfere with these natural capacities that we're wanting to develop from coming online, things like connection and trust and authenticity, being able to say no and set boundaries, a lot of these things that we are sort of designed as humans to learn in this incremental developmental process, when that gets disrupted, it can start to really shape the way we relate to ourselves, shape the way we relate to the world and to other people in these pretty profound ways. And so when we're talking about developmental trauma, we're talking about things that that cause disruption in these early periods where we're 
really forming the basis of our identity and, and our nervous systems and how we're relating to the world. It's, you know, when I started to really understand the impact that my childhood had on me as an adult, it felt both empowering and disempowering at the same time, right? Because <laughs> on the yeah. one hand, it's like, oh, I get it. <laughs> this is why. And of course, as yeah. meaning-making, you know, humans, we like to know why. And it's like, oh, this is why? It feels like I now can name something. I can understand something. It helps with self-awareness, et cetera. But at the same time, it can feel so frustrating because it's like, well, but I can't change what happened. You know, this yeah. is, this, this just happened. And are you telling me that now I'm fucked, you know, like now I yeah. just have to be this way forever. Um, and I'm curious how you've navigated that tension in your own life. Yeah. I mean, my experience was similar. <laughs> <laughs> so just for the record, you're not fucked if you experience <laughs> a lot of trauma. I mean, it, it can create persistent challenges, you know, if yeah. we experienced a lot of trauma in our early lives, but there's, there are so many tools and healing modalities and things that we can do to start to, to navigate that and process that. So wherever anyone is listening to this, you're not stuck there. <laughs> so good to know that, but yeah, know it, that. I mean, it is, I mean, I am, I think like many two-year-olds, my favorite question my whole life has been why, like, you know, yeah. why is this happening? What's going yes. on? And so it can be very intellectually satisfying to start to understand, you know, why we do some of the things that we do. But ultimately, I think part of what's so powerful about understanding developmental trauma, yes, it answers a lot of the why questions, but it also starts to help us navigate this question of, of who am I in this deeper way? And not, it's not a question that necessarily has an answer because who we are is, is changing in every moment. But when these things happen that have such an impact on our sense of self and our sense of identity, we can start to peel back these ideas of who we thought we were, which may be kind of embedded with trauma messaging, things like, you know, there's something wrong with me, or I'm not good enough, those kinds of things that we start to believe about ourselves. Addressing developmental trauma can start to help us see a little bit more gray area, a little more nuance and a little bit more truth about who we are without all of these added layers of, of pain and, and expectation layered on top. I, yeah, I, I really resonate with that. And I have often thought that there was something really wrong with me, something really broken about the fact that I just kept rubbing up against kind of existential sense of who am I and this not knowing who I am. Um, and for me, that often plays out in like fashion, which is a very fascinating, mm -hmm. like small kind of concrete way that this plays out of like, if I knew who I was, then I would have this like fashion identity, right? You see people, right, right who, who have a, a way of being in the world that's very consistent, and I've always thought that the fact that I don't know who I am results in me not being able to present myself consistently through clothes or whatever. Um, and understanding developmental trauma has helped me make sense of why it has felt so difficult for me to really know, to have this quote unquote knowing as if it's this maybe arrival destination point, which it isn't. And at the same time, there is something very unnerving about being so plagued by this question and chronically feeling like, what's wrong with me? Why don't I know? And, and if I knew how much easier my life would be and how easier relationships would be. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of, I spend a lot of time working with groups and there's something I've observed time and time again, that's been so interesting is I think so many people walking around with that thought, like there's something wrong with me. Don't realize that everyone else is walking around. Mm -hmm. Maybe not everyone else, but most other people are walking around with that, that same thought. And so when that starts to, to come to light in these sort of group conversations, there's something really shame dissolving about that because so many of us received messages either very explicitly or maybe more implicitly 
that who we are, like how we were expressing ourselves, especially in our early lives, wasn't okay. That wasn't okay. It wasn't acceptable. Maybe we got punished or made fun of or ignored. And so we start to internalize these interactions that we have with people. And, you know, especially when we're just developing, we don't have a lot of capacity to see nuance or be able to place ourselves in someone else's shoes and think, oh, maybe they were having a bad day. It's like, no, there's something wrong with me that this person said this to me. And through a child's eyes, that's the quickest, most efficient way to start to to make sense of what's happening. And it also leaves us with some sense of control. It's like, if it's my fault, there's something wrong with me, then maybe I can change it. And so a lot of these things that um, and the, the model that I practice, the neuroeffective relational model or NARM, they talk about it as environmental failures. Like when, when we aren't attuned to by our caregivers or when we aren't mirrored by our peers in certain ways, or if we're neglected or rejected, all these things, we internalize that. And we assume that it's because there's something we're not doing or because we're bad or we're broken. So a lot of healing developmental trauma is, is starting to unpack that a little bit more from an adult perspective and start to see a little bit of the, the nuance and the gray area. We just didn't have the capacity to see when we were little. And so of course, I imagine that people listening and who may have not heard of developmental trauma before, I mean, my first question would be, you know, how do I know? How do I know if I experienced developmental trauma or how do I know that what experienced, you know, was trauma or was it just every childhood is hard, you know, like there's environmental failings in almost every childhood. It's very impossible to have a perfect childhood. I don't know anyone actually who's had a perfect childhood. So how does one know if what they experienced is developmental trauma or just the stressors of being human? It's such a great question. It's a question I get a lot. And there's going to be differing, you know, thoughts on this from different people. My perspective is that the label isn't, I mean, the label can be helpful if it helps us make sense of our experience. But ultimately, if you're having a lot of symptoms, like if you're experiencing a lot of distress in your adult life where, you know, you're you have a really difficult time creating or maintaining healthy relationships. You have really low sense of self-worth. If you're experiencing a lot of anxiety, depression, eating disorders, um, these kinds of things, it doesn't really matter so much, you know, if the label of trauma applies or not, like chances are there's, there's something going on here. And so I'm, you know, as a provider, going to be very curious about what's happening, that these symptoms are showing up. And so I think about it more about like looking at the effects rather than looking at the causes in some ways. That being said, um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that they had developmental trauma because a lot of people don't remember their childhoods very well. So that can be part of it. Or you know, maybe people around them had it worse. And so they are able to kind of look at their own experience and say, oh, well, I didn't have it that bad. That doesn't necessarily mean it didn't have a traumatic impact, but that may be how they're relating to it. So there are a lot of reasons why people may not know if they experienced trauma or not. What I will say that I feel is pretty important is that it's very easy to look at our childhood experiences through an adult lens and say like, oh, well, that's not that big of a deal because it wouldn't be for us now, perhaps, because we have more tools and resources and capacities online as adults. But if you're six months old, things that may seem like no big deal, like, you know, if your mom walks out of the room for hours as a 25-year-old, it has a very different impact than if you're six months old and you know, you're know you hungry and you're wet and you don't know if anyone's ever coming back for you, you're completely helpless, you're completely dependent on your caregivers. And so things 
register as extremely threatening for a small child that we might be able to look back and kind of brush off and say, oh, that wasn't a big deal. So we have to think about these things in context. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And it, I noticed that it's very helpful for people who may be starting to process and understand their childhood is, is when they have a child, maybe not necessarily yeah. a parent who has a child, but just has a child in their vicinity, a nephew, a niece, you know, right. some child. Um, sometimes it can be helpful to even just go to you know, a playground, go to where there are kids. I mean, maybe that's not a good advice, particularly for men, but you know what I mean? Like, like, you know, yeah. go, you found yourself with kids and you start to understand how different children at different age points understand the world. It can really contextualize our experience at that time, which is why I think parenthood can be such an eye-opening experience of really coming to terms with the failings of our parents in a way that's actually very important and healthy to see where they have failed and where they may have done really well. Um, and I, and, and, and I'm also thinking as you're talking about how um, tenacious is this kind of need to hold our parents as the good objects yeah. um, for survival, right? And, and why it can be really hard to come to terms with um, any type of trauma in childhood uh, because it was so important in the preservation of attachment to make those parents be good and therefore now we are the bad ones for not getting our needs met. And that can also really interfere with the, not, maybe not interfere, but it can certainly impact the healing process. If we first need to come to terms with the fact that our parents probably failed us. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you highlighted that. I mean, that's something um, Lawrence Heller, the creator of NARM talks about a lot. You know, it's this way of presenting, preserving a sense of, of hopefulness, but it, as you mentioned, it's so important for preserving the attachment relationship as well, because we are completely dependent on our parents. They, I mean, in an ideal world, they're providing all of our needs, but even when they're not, they're providing, you know, whatever we're getting, we have no sense of agency and control. We can't go out in the world and, and take care of ourselves. And so if we were to conceptualize our parents as bad, let's say we're five years old and we have 13 more years being sort of trapped mm -hmm. in their care, that would be absolutely overwhelming, devastating, you know, impossible to cope with for a small child that you know, I'm stuck here with this bad person who won't take care of my needs. That would just be too much for, mm -hmm. for anyone really. But you know, certainly a five-year-old. And so this is a way that we, we start to cope with that is by making ourselves the bad one, preserving our parents as the good one. And it's so critical for our survival that starting to change that narrative can be really painful. Even, you know, I've worked with people in their fifties, sixties who are still struggling with that because it's just, it becomes so central to our, our way of orienting toward the world that our parents are good and we're bad. It's like a, the way uh, Dr. Heller talks about it, it becomes a stable part of our personality structure that we're the bad ones. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it can take a lot of, of time to start to shift that perspective. I, I've recently finished my hours to become licensed in the state okay. of California. Yeah. And so I've had a little bit of time on my hands and I decided that I was going to reread the, the, some of the Harry Potter books, nice. um, <laughs> <laughs> very classic millennial to do task. Um, you know, I grew up on Harry Potter. The first book came out when I was 11. So, of course, I read it and I immediately, you know, anticipated from my letter from Hogwarts, you know. So, so <laughs> the Harry Potter books were kind of central to my childhood. And now rereading them, I have a, a totally different, obviously, as we grow older, we have different perspectives. But I, but now more than ever, I read these books, Iris, and I have a really hard time with how uh, uh, 
well Harry Potter is, <laughs> mm. like how uh, functional he is, how in many ways he shows secure attachment. In many ways, he he relates to his friends and the community in a way that if he experienced the level of neglect and abuse uh, mm. that the books depict him experiencing from ages, you know, six months when he, well, however month baby he was when his parents were killed in front of him, right, to mm. 11. I mean, I'm like, J.K. Rowling, we need to get you into some developmental psychology <laughs> classes because he just would not be this well, uh, yeah, this, this mentally functional in society. Anyway, so, you know, like, t tell me you agree with me, Iris, because I feel like this has been just so top of mind to me and I need someone to affirm. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I have two minds about what you're saying. Part of me is like, you're absolutely 100% correct. And it is 99.9% .9 of the time that is, is not going to be a realistic outcome that someone's going to be able to rise above all of that, especially at a young age and be able to form healthy attachments when their own upbringing has been so tumultuous and, and damaging. So absolutely true. And it's funny, I was actually just talking to a colleague of mine, um, a therapist named Rebecca Perlman, and we were talking about how this, this also, I don't know what your spiritual beliefs are, are but it kind of speaks to something about the human spirit and the human soul, there are some people who in the most impossible of circumstances, maybe they're an old soul who knows, like I, I won't pretend that I think that I know, but there are some people who manage to just, you know, have this like deeper connection to source or something else and are able to navigate some of these things in a way that, that don't really make sense. I mean, I know a few people like that in my life who just had, you know, horrific upbringings and there's just something in them that they've been able to, to rise above that. Or I don't even know if that's the right terminology, but yeah, it, it is interesting. I mean, the human spirit is so mysterious and there are people who somehow miraculously, um, yeah, are just not as affected. And I wasn't one of those people. So, you know, I was very impacted by my childhood and really struggled to form healthy attachments and have done a lot of work on that. But um, it is interesting that sometimes we're not always purely just products of our environment. Yeah, I think, you know, this is where psychology, as much as we want it to be an exact science, it's just like nutritional science. It is not an exact science. Every body metabolizes and relates to food differently, you know, and, and that is true for our minds. And I think it begs the question of nature versus nurture yeah. and the unpredictability of the forming of human personality. Um, and th this is where then I really, really struggle. You know, I took a month break from Instagram and I came back literally today and mm. I'm struggling with coming back and relating to Instagram when there's just so much broad brushstrokes that are being painted and diagnosing that's being done and um, a kind of telling you what your experience is rather than kind of offering space and opportunity for people to understand their own experience right and I think you're bringing up a really good point with Harry Potter it's like who the fuck knows why Harry Potter <laughs> turned out the way it did? Maybe it's because yeah. J.K. Rowling has no no teeth in developmental psychology, or maybe because something really held strong within him, and and he you know persevered in a way that we cannot understand. But what if what if Iris there was someone on Instagram, a Harry Potter, for example, influencer on Instagram, right, telling everybody that they just need to rise above their trauma, right? right? Yes. Or like I wasn't impacted and therefore you shouldn't be either and they wouldn't maybe yeah. necessarily use that language but we've sure. seen it we've seen oh, the yeah. language of people who use their own experience as a way of um verifying that this should be more people's experiences a hundred percent yeah you, I mean you do see that all the time maybe not an exactly that language but pretty close yeah <laughs> pretty close <laughs> yeah or maybe even verbatim in some cases but yeah I mean I think Instagram is a, a tricky platform. I 
grapple with it myself sometimes because all of these things are so context dependent and individually dependent. And, you know, I try to capture nuance as well as I possibly can, but you can't, I mean, even if you were to use like 10 slides packed full of text and then, you know, max out the caption, you're not going to cover everything. And so, yeah, it's, it's tricky. And I, I, I really feel for people actually who are trying to navigate the world of Insta therapy or just mental health, personal growth kind of content on Instagram, because it's a lot to parse through. And if you aren't also like really steeped in the clinical literature and stuff like that, it can be especially challenging to figure out what's what and what applies to me and what doesn't apply to me and all of that. So yeah, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot to navigate. Yeah, it's a lot to navigate. And I, you know, when we're thinking about something like developmental trauma, our context is is key. You know, our context is the only way that we can possibly understand what happened and what healing is required. And so if you're listening to this, you know, it's important to get individualized support, particularly Mm -hmm. if you start, you're getting a sense that maybe there was trauma going on in your childhood. I mean, these things can't be done by themselves, um, healed by themselves. We, we don't heal, you know, especially, especially developmental trauma is often um, relational trauma, right? Yeah. And we only heal relational trauma in relationships, really. Precisely. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, I always feel like a little bit of a broken record, but I'm okay with it because whenever I do Q and A's or things like that, and I feel like it, in almost every other post, I mentioned something about talking to a professional because especially when we're dealing with these really, you know, foundational aspects of, of who we are, which developmental trauma inevitably, you know, touches on trying to navigate that by yourself is really, really challenging. And I mean, I would say that's true for a lot of things that people might be processing, but I feel like, especially when we're looking at complex trauma or childhood trauma, it's just, yeah, it gets a little murky if you're trying to, or maybe a lot murky if you're trying to navigate that. And so I I always hope if people are, you know, reading my content online or watching my content online, that that's a starting point for inquiry and, and further research and, you know, talking to their own therapist or coach or professional about it rather than like, this is the truth. This is the end point. You know, this definitely applies to you because what I'm writing may not apply, or there may be some aspect that I didn't think to incorporate that is more important for them. And so, I mean, I would say this when looking at any content online, if it touches something in you, great. If if it doesn't feel like a fit, then maybe it's not a fit. And if you're unsure, you know, talking to somebody about it and and doing your own research can, can really help take whatever that content is and have it land more specifically for you and your special context. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the internet will verify whatever you want it to verify you know I I saw a TikTok (laughs) and there was this guy talking about like is this coffee lead to blindness I bet you if I google coffee leads to blindness I'll find something that tells you that coffee leads to blindness so then he showed his screen as he googled coffee leads to blindness and right there top of the thing yes coffee can lead to blindness and he goes and I bet you then if I google the opposite I'll also find the opposite and that was also true you know if you google coffee can help with eyesight you will find a study that shows that coffee actually can improve eyesight and so whatever you search you're going to find and I think that that's this is where we've come to right with misinformation and um, false news or fake news you know is that we're finding whatever it is that we want to find um, and that data is not is not necessarily what's going to take us into healing um, I'm so glad you brought that up because this applies just as much to psychology. You can find a psychologist out there who will say nothing that happened in your childhood matters. It's all about who you are as an adult. You will find people who will say, you know, every facet of your personality is a trauma response. So it'll be people who say that only life and death 
experiences like combat count as trauma. Like you can find whatever, whatever your personal bias is or whatever you're hoping to find, you can find somebody who will share that belief. And, you know, I'm sure you can find people with doctorate degrees who can, you know, who fall into all of those different camps. So it gets very confusing. And that's why um, I was actually just talking to Hillary McBride. She wrote a book called the wisdom of your body that just came out recently that I recommend for people to check out. There's something about, you know, in this world of misinformation and fake news, learning to reconnect to ourselves, learning to reconnect to our bodies, which also means reconnecting to our gut instincts Mm -hmm. is increasingly more important because it is difficult to parse out what's what and, and what's true and what isn't or what applies to us and what doesn't. And so the more connected we are to our bodies, the more connected we are to ourselves, the more we can use that sort of intuition, that, that gut check to really feel if something is true or if we're being sort of manipulated or maybe it just doesn't apply to us. But I think that's an important aspect of healing trauma that, that doesn't get talked about as much in this context. If, if we're disembodied and disconnected, we're much more susceptible to that sort of fake news type of manipulation. Absolutely. And bringing ourselves back to full circle when we're talking about not knowing who we are, then we're so much more easily influenced. And I can definitely attest to that in my past. It's very easy to want to, if we don't know who we are, we often find ourselves selling out to belong, right? Right. Like we, we lose ourselves in attempts to belong somewhere. And so, you know, this is where we find the psychology of cults. This is where we'll find the psych- like the ways in which we enter these dangerous belief systems is because we're so desperate to belong, stemming often, I think, out of a place of not knowing who we are. And so there's such an intimate connection, as you're saying, between knowing who we are and our intuition, our gut, our, our knowing how to be in our body and be in our experience. So true. I mean, you're basically describing me in my 20s. Yeah. Just like no idea who I was, just like being this chameleon trying to figure out, okay, like how can I get people to accept me? I don't accept myself. So I'm at least going to try to get everyone else to accept me. And that meant turning myself into a pretzel and, you know, showing up in all these different ways in different places. And it was so, I mean, it didn't work (laughs) first of all. Well, I guess it worked to a point, you know, I was able to like form social connections, but I felt really empty inside Mm -hmm. through that Mm -hmm. because I was so disconnected from myself and yeah, it's been quite a journey back, <laughs> quite a journey back. Same, same. And so, you know, thinking about how important it is for us to do this work and to get support is that really it, it, it reminds me as we're thinking about this, that like, this is about more than just Um, alleviating symptoms, right? Like this is about developing a relationship with ourselves that allows us to walk on this planet a little bit more grounded and and nourished and supported and healed and not so, so easily succumbed to the pressures of other people thinking, other people, um, um, people pleasing, you know, getting sucked into fond response and, and, yeah, just, I'm, I'm just, I like, I'm like overwhelmed in my mind of like thinking of all the ways in which this is really important work. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And I feel like we're at this time when I, mean, I feel like the world has always had a lot of complexity and a lot of challenges and weirdness, but it does feel like the rate of change is accelerating so quickly. And we have, I think maybe what's changed is we just have so much more access to all the complexity. We're, we're able to get these windows into all these different things that have been unfolding. We just haven't been able to see them. And so 
it's like, yeah, it's just, it's a confusing time <laughs> to be alive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think life has probably always been confusing, but you know, I think it's maybe extra confusing. And I just, I think a lot about young people who are growing up, you know, in like school age at this time and how overwhelming and confusing that must be. And so I just feel like I, I'm hoping, and it, it seems like this has been happening that this last year and a half, almost two years now has changed people's perspective on getting support. It's like, I think we all can recognize that we probably need some, you know, at mm-hmm. this point. And um, I feel like some of the stigma around seeing a therapist and, and getting some kind of mental health support is lessening. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Because, you know, it's a, the human experience is a lot to yeah to sift through. Yeah. Really and we is. were never meant to do it by ourselves. And I think we never were. Yeah. Western culture has really made us think that we have to be like Harry Potter, you know, which by the way, getting beyond the, the unrealism of his childhood, I think the whole theme of the books, right. Is about, uh, learning that we are not in it alone and that we can lean on other people and that there are surprising ways that there are support everywhere and that we often do to developmental relational trauma close ourselves off to it but that support is here and we don't have to do it alone we don't and I'm so glad you mentioned that because um something you know I've been thinking about a lot I'm having a child in a few months, my husband and I have been reflecting a lot on, you know, how we feel about her use of technology as she gets older. And I feel like it's so important to remember that, you know, even though we have access to people on our devices, our device is not a person. Like we need real human connection, real time. Asynchronous communication is, is nice and, you know, important, but FaceTiming or, you know, I mean, obviously preferably, especially outside of a pandemic, being with people in person is so essential for, I mean, we're social creatures. And so if every time we're feeling distressed, every time we're feeling lonely, we just turn to our device, Mm -hmm. we're missing out on so much. And we're just not, we're just not built to to exist in that way. So, yeah. yeah, I know it's especially hard right now, but hopefully that will, I really hope fingers crossed that 2022 will have a little bit more normalcy in terms of gathering together again. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Well, this has been such a beautiful conversation. I really appreciate your thoughts and I will, you know, drop everything in the show notes for people who are interested in connecting with you and following you. And um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And I just want to say really quickly, if if people are are really curious about developmental trauma specifically, there's a book Mm -hmm. by Lawrence Heller called Healing Developmental Trauma that was really mind-blowing and eye-opening for me. So if that's a topic that is of interest, I definitely recommend checking out that book. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I'll add that to the show notes as well. Great. Thanks.